We welcome everyone who is with us today. This is the Allyship and the Massachusetts 54th Advancing Our Journey to an Anti-Racist America. It's a community conversation hosted by the Partnership to Renew the Shaw 54th Memorial. And without further ado, we'll begin our program, sit back and relax. Please use the chat room. Please use the Q&A box for our friends who are here in the Zoom room. Without further ado, our program will begin. Good evening, everyone. My name is Liz Visa, and I am president of the Friends of the Public Garden. On behalf of the Friends, the National Parks of Boston, the City of Boston, and the Museum of African American History, thank you so much for joining us. It is our pleasure, the partnership to renew the Shaw 54th Memorial, to welcome you to our fourth community conversation and the third one in a virtual format, Allyship and the Massachusetts 54th, advancing our journey to an anti-racist America. In 2018, we came together in partnership to provide the critical restoration work necessary to ensure this monument was standing tall on a strong foundation for generations to come. From the outset, the partnership was committed to using this work as a platform to share the full stories behind the meaning, the history, the relevance of the Shaw 54th Memorial, one of America's greatest monuments, and a truly inspirational telling of the allyship between Colonel Shaw and the men of the 54th. We have used this opportunity to convene conversations around race, equity, and social justice. Informed by history, but grounded in today's reality, these discussions are critically important for us to be having at this time. To be a friend means to care deeply, to listen and to feel compassion. But to be an ally means to act, to make space and to use our platforms to bring awareness to the important issues impacting our neighbors and ultimately the health of our community. As the country reckons with our complicated history, we all have been challenged to examine our own roles in the structures of America as allies and advancers in the fight towards freedom or as accomplices in maintaining the status quo. Each of us must examine our roles boldly, using our positions of privilege and power to speak out about the many different ways that racism infects our culture and hurts not only those it is directed towards, but it hurts us all. The creation of the 54th was the culmination of decades of interracial activism in the fight for emancipation and racial justice. Local and national African-American leaders such as Lewis Hayden and Frederick Douglass worked hand in hand with white leaders such as Massachusetts Governor John Andrew and Senator Charles Sumner to create this groundbreaking regiment. Within the 54th itself, Shaw and the other white officers trained and fought alongside black soldiers and stood with them in pursuit of equal pay. The community that created and funded this inspiring memorial to this heroic regiment also represented a powerful interracial alliance between black leaders and white philanthropists. For more than 120 years, this monument has symbolized the strength of interracial cooperation in advancing the cause of human freedom while also reflecting the complexity of our American history. As brilliant as Augustus St. Gauden's work is, it is not without controversy or criticism and sheds a powerful light on the racial disparities of the time that it represents and in which it was created. Tonight with our esteemed panelists, we will use the stories of the brave 54th and the monument itself to explore the importance and challenges of allyship in the journey towards an anti-racist America. After months of detailed restoration work on site and off, this historic bronze masterpiece has returned to Boston Common and been placed on a new concrete foundation. The beautiful stonework of this memorial is being reconstructed around it. And soon this important preservation effort will be complete. The partnership is so looking forward to welcoming you all back to the Common for the monuments unveiling in May and his rededication in October. Thank you again for joining us. And now I'd like to turn it over to our moderator, WCVB's Director of Public Affairs and host of CityLine, Karen Holmes Ward. Karen, thank you so much. We are so grateful for your expert guidance of these important dialogues. 
Thank you, Liz. And good evening, everyone. I'm honored to serve uh, as your moderator as we continue this series of community conversations around renewing the Shaw 54th Memorial and the dialogue on race. For those who are joining us for the first time, it's important to note that these conversations allow us to commemorate the story of Colonel Robert Gould Shaw and the mighty 54th Massachusetts Glory Regiment, so dubbed by the Hollywood dramatization for which Denzel Washington won an Oscar. As Liz touched on, the much deeper story of the regiment and the St. Gaudens bronze tribute to them continues to evolve and exemplify the complexities of the American story, especially as it pertains to who we call our heroes and how we commemorate their legacy. We stand by the belief that the Shaw 54th Memorial also continues to serve as a beacon of hope and a rallying point for conversations about race, justice, and human rights. Today's headlines remind us of how important these conversations are. The insurrection at the Capitol and efforts by more than three dozen state legislatures to strike down hard-won advances in voting rights remind us that historically, some alliances have been fueled by hate. However, stronger still are those allyships that cross cultural boundaries to uplift Black, Latinx, Asian, and Indigenous communities in solidarity. Through this forum, we ask questions of historians, thought leaders, and you, our audience participants, to help shape the important dialogue on race and breathe life into the powerful civil rights and social justice torch that the 54th, their allies, and so many others have passed over to us. That leads us to what I'm sure will be a very thought provoking conversation that our panelists will have with each other and with us before we meet them. Please understand your role as audience participants. First, we ask that you take a moment to share on social media now and during the program. Invite friends to join us for tonight's interactive dialogue on Facebook at Friends of the Public Garden. Look for it in the chat. Second, we invite you to add your voice to the conversation. In Zoom, post a question or comment in the chat or Q&A. On Facebook, post it as a comment. And please keep your thoughts on topic. Allyship and the Massachusetts 54th, advancing our journey to an anti-racist America. And please honor our request for this conversation to remain nonpartisan and respectful of others. Finally, please keep each question or comment under 25 words. We'll thread your questions throughout the program and include as many as time allows. Now let's meet our special guests. Malia Lazu, activist and lecturer at MIT's Sloan School of Management and founder of the Urban Labs. Lazu also is founder of the Lazu Group and an award-winning strategist in diversity and inclusion who has sparked economic development and investment in urban entrepreneurship. Janae Osterhelt, Boston Globe culture columnist and creator, curator of the multimedia documentary series, A Beautiful Resistance. Osterhelt writes about identity and social justice focusing on the lives and voices of people of color. John Stauffer, Professor of English and African American Studies at Harvard University, Stauffer has written on abolition, social protest, and photography. His most recent work, Picturing Frederick Douglass, written with collaborators Zoe Trod and Celeste Bernier, explores Douglass' use of photography to combat racism. Now, there's more information about each of our participants, and it can be found online at Shaw 54th Memorial Restoration. Org. And now, the first question, which goes to everyone. Tonight, we focus on allyship and use the 54th Massachusetts and the Shaw 54th Memorial as reference for the conversation. But before we dive more fully into the history of the 54th itself, I ask you all to please tell us what does allyship mean to you? How do you define it? Audience participants, please enter your answers in the chat while we invite Janae, Malia, 
and John to respond. Janae, I'll start with you. What does allyship mean to you and how do you define it? Um, allyship, first and foremost, is a verb. Um, I think it's a fun word people like to use, kind of like diversity, where it's a word they throw around to make themselves look good, but they don't always back it up with action. Um, I think it's about leveraging power and privilege to help people who have less of a stage and less of a platform than you. I don't like to use the term voiceless because I don't believe anyone's voiceless. I believe we live in a system that silences people. Um, it's not just about fi fighting racism, it's about fighting supremacy period. And that includes all peoples. I think um, what is, is important to remember is that as much as me as a black woman, I need an ally. There's also people I can be an ally to. All of us are more privileged than someone else, no matter where we are in the fight. Um, and as allies, we can't just use our power and privilege um, to dismantle supremacy that we don't take part in. We also have to use it to be accountable for what we are complicit in. Um, because in my opinion, all of us are complicit are complicit in some way. If you live in this country, you're under the umbrella of supremacy and you're infected. So there's always ways in which we can be checking ourselves. So, you know, accountability is a love language. All right, Malia, um, tell us what allyship means to you and how you define it. Well, first of all, ditto. Um, I think Janae got us started. I was like, I define it like that. Um, and so I just want to expand a little bit, especially as I was thinking about Shaw, you know, and, and his parents were abolitionists and abolitionists were for the abolition of slavery, not the reform of slavery, not defending well-meaning slave owners, right? They said, this is unacceptable to sell black bodies. So that should stop. And for me, allyship starts there. It starts in this is unacceptable and therefore I am going to be a traitor to my race, right? Mm -hmm. And I am going to actually turn my back on my supremacy. Um, I often see allyship as putting your body either in front of mine or replacing yours with mine, right? That's true allyship. And, and I think just like Janae said, you know, that we often say like, oh, I'm an ally for the cause. You might be empathetic, you might be supportive, but true allyship is complying, you know, it's, it's being a, an accomplice. It's, it's mm. being, um, it, it's willing to go against everything you were taught and, and the stories you were told. And I'll end by saying, I also, you know, agree that we can all be allies. I make it a point to be very active in the disability community because it's a community that's so invisible and that it's so in need of allyship. And for all of us, you know, black women, black men, you know, LGBTQ community, if you are able body, you are in fact very privileged in this world. And it's really important for us to find areas where we have privilege so that we in fact can be an ally. Betsy Reagan in the chat just um, commented that she's heard it described as someone being a co-conspirator. So John Stauffer, what does allyship mean to you and, and how do you define it? I like those terms. I like co-conspirator. Um, I also have used the term comrades um, in fighting a common enemy uh, coming together or um, uh, collaborators. Um, the Civil War offers a great example of, of allyship at the beginning of the war. And for most of the war, most Northern whites, their main goal in waging war was to preserve the Union, not to end slavery. For African Americans, the chief goal of the war was to vanquish slavery. And very quickly, it, both sides recognized that in order to preserve the union, they had to destroy slavery. In order to destroy slavery, they had to preserve the union. And that came out very early. African-Americans served in integrated units in the Navy from the beginning of the war. The Navy was out of the spotlight and the uh, Army and uh, the Lincoln administration understood that blacks were much more sophisticated in the waterways. They knew the waterways. Uh, and uh, so it, um, it took a while for um, soldiers to uh, be integrated. But by mid-war, most Union 
officers and certainly generals and Lincoln himself, who had never called himself an abolitionist, recognized that the, the, the most important means for winning the war was to uh, arm slaves, to free, to free blacks and arm them. Um, and in fact, there's a quote from Lincoln in 1864. He says, we cannot spare the 140,000 blacks now serving us as soldiers, seamen, and laborers. This is not a question of sentiment or taste, but one of physical force. Keep it, and you can save the Union, throw it away, and the Union goes with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, General so Grant, as another example, General Grant, who was anything but an abolitionist before the war, in his 63, he says, arming Blacks with emancipation is the heaviest blow yet dealt to the enemy. John Stauffer, I always say this, I need to go back to school so I can take your class. <laughs> um, just reading the chat again, uh, Antex Era says that allyship is moving beyond vocal support to actually taking action. And, and let's go into some of the history. Um, Robert Goodshaw um, probably could not be described as an ally uh, initially or a co-conspirator. He did not share the strong abolitionist convictions of his parents. In fact, when Massachusetts Governor John Andrew first offered him command of the 54th, he turned it down. Uh, despite his reluctance, Shaw grew to respect the men of the 54th and ultimately gave his life, uh, as we know, alongside many of them at the Battle of Fort Wagner in South Carolina in 1863. John, we're gonna turn back to you. Please speak to the first part of this question to give us uh, some historical context. So why was Colonel Shaw initially hesitant? Please tell us about the influence his parents had in supporting his development and his choices. Yeah, his mom in particular was a staunch uh, abolitionist and very much encouraged him. He was reluctant. He had made it clear he was not an abolitionist. Um, in fact, he really, shine for the first time in his life um, when he entered um, the military with the Civil War. He had been a Harvard student, but uh, was in the lowest quartile, I think, or third of his class. Uh, and he succeeded as a, an officer. Um, so one, he was, he was an abolitionist. He worried that there'd be too much opposition by whites against a, a regiment that he would raise. Um, and uh, he was uh, eventually, he well, fairly quickly decided to serve as uh, officer of the 54th because he wanted to prove that blacks would make good soldiers. Um, mm -hmm. And so it was his, he re recognized his role as an officer. He had served prior to that in uh, the second um, Massachusetts Infantry. He rose up from first, second lieutenant to first lieutenant. Uh, and then became a captain. He had been twice wounded at both Antietam and Cedar Mountain. So he had a, he had a considerable amount of experience as a soldier and as an officer. And ultimately it was an opportunity for him to see if he could uh, continue his uh, success um, with the 54th. Mm. So we've um, described uh, Colonel Shaw as hesitant to become an ally, Janae, um, Malia, what strategies um, might be used to help initially hesitant people become allies, accomplices, co-conspirators mm -hmm. in today's fight for equality and racial justice? Janae? I saw Malia's mute go off, so I was going to defer to okay. her. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Go ahead. No, please. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, Here's the thing, um, it, you know, people are going to feel away because I'm about to quote Dave Chappelle, but it is what it is. Um, you know, Dave Chappelle says often there are no perfect players and there aren't. There are no perfect players. That's why I was very clear in my earlier answer to say, like, it's, it's also our job to be allies. Mm -hmm. um, all of us are complicit in some level in enjoying the fruits of our privilege and our power. Um, and it's going to cost everybody, it's going to cost everybody power and privilege and comforts, comforts that they've gotten used to, to ensure equity. 
Um, and that requires convincing. It requires, it shouldn't, it shouldn't. But we, as we've seen with COVID are very individualistic people. Um, we are, we care more about ourselves than we do the collective. And that's just, that's not just white people. It's like, it's, a, it's very much me and mine's and who's in my house versus the collective. And that's a function of white supremacy for sure. But us understanding that discomfort is necessary for collective comfort is kind of one of those first steps. Um, us understanding the ways in which we all have been infected by white supremacy and capitalism is another step. Um, I think it, I grapple with framing it as convincing people um, because it's so hurtful and remains hurtful that we have to fight for, for people to recognize our humanity, that the whole, you know, the, 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 the Chauvin trial is going on and it's like people had to see a man be lynched uh, to recognize our humanity. So it, I struggle with the idea that we're still having to fight people, um, to beg people, to convince people to, to be comrades, to, to fight alongside. However, it's necessary work. So we do have to use use what we can to get people to understand whether it's raised fist in the streets, policy, voting, um, laying out the ways in which the thing about the soldiers is y'all came to respect them fighting alongside them because they were benefiting him. So I hate to frame it capitalistically, but we have to show people how equity uh, is only better for everybody, how equity serves us all. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's, it's cringy to say, but it's just, this is the country we live in. This is the psyche we have. And that's how I look at it. It's like, you have to show, it's like when you go into a company and you're like, oh, inclusion is going to help, help you grow as a company. It's going to make the business better. And then they're like, oh yeah. Or, mm -hmm. you know, I hate to do things that way, but sometimes you have to fight people with their weapons. Sometimes uh, in, in the corporate world, they call it the business case for diversity. Yeah. That, uh, yeah that you know, we'll make more money if we have a diverse staff. And then people suddenly, uh, oh yeah, okay, I get it. Someone in the chat said we need to get uncomfortable with being uncomfortable. Malia, you know, what strategies would you employ to help hesitant people become allies or accomplices or, or, or co-conspirators? So I think like any um, verb or like any action, <clears throat> it takes practice. And the, you know, as I know, who's someone who likes to, you know, think about my yoga practice. Um, you know, when I first started it, I was not really doing yoga practice, right? Like I was bending and trying to stay up and shaking and sweating and um, not relaxing at all, not feeling the meditative joy of the process. Um, I was uncomfortable. I was embarrassed in front of other people um, who obviously could down with dog like nobody's business. And it's, you know, it's important to remember that even the best white allies check themselves and even the best allies in anything it's a consistent checking and being open to be checked now i also want to say something that might be controversial but i'd like us to sit with it for a minute allyship co-conspiratorship that's great i will just take common decency as a start and that's where I think, you know, we actually need to reflect on ourselves that this idea that everyone's going to be John Brown or, you know, um, that the wife of the Schwarmer Goodwin, you know, like that's not everybody. But how about this? How about you do question cops motivations because they keep to be killing people all the time? Like, why don't you? wonder why cops act differently. Do you call your police station and ask them how they feel, you know, about black people? Do they have black cops in your white neighborhood? You know, um, there was this uh, study that came out that showed 75% of white people do not have one non-white friend. Hmm. Let's start there. And then we'll train you to be John Brown's. That, 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 that's not the hard part. I need, I need to start with you being willing to see me as a part of your tribe. And I don't call that allyship, you know, from the way I was raised, that's called decency and being a good Christian. Okay, so um, I'm gonna pick up a few conversations in the uh, comments in the chat and lead uh, to John. 
Um, Betsy says, in a discussion with the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization, a white man ventured that it's hard to quote unquote, give up power. Uh, the answer came back, well, what if you don't see it as giving up power, but sharing power with? And then Leslie asks, how does a white person know when they have become an ally? And John, I'll ask you that question. People know they become an ally, whether it's in the Civil War today, when you're working with, you're allied with people very different from you, uh, who don't come from the same backgrounds, who don't look like you, whether they're racially or ethnically different, whether they're different in terms of gender, and you're working together for this common cause. And uh, 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 Malia, what you said about respect or about decency is foundational. It's what sh every human should um, project to other humans is basic decency. It's a fundamental feature of humanity. Uh, and uh, I mean, frankly, in the United States today, uh, if, you know, if for conserv white conservatives, part of the reason they've become so militant is because they recognize that American, the idea of American democracy, just based on the demographics, is a multiracial, multiethnic democracy. Whereas for most of the, the United States history, democracy defi was defined in terms of white men. That shift really frightens a lot of people and they got to get over it. They have mm -hmm. to understand basic humanity and the, I under the notion that a democracy, the, the best democracies are truly multiracial, multiethnic democracies. Mm. And can I jump in there and say that I think folks also need to understand that it hurts them. Yes. You know, Frederick yes. Douglass talked about as his slave master became more violent because that was like the thing to do back then was to become more violent as they got more slaves that, you know, he drank more that he, the slave master had to kill his own humanity yes. in order to be a, a slave master. And when you look at the violence that's just coming out of the, you know, white toxic masculinity, like, this is where it comes from. It comes from the need of the power. You know, I find it interesting where someone says it's hard to give up power. It shouldn't be hard to give up power if your power is stepping on my neck, yeah. right? Like, like that shouldn't be hard, but we haven't actually made that connection yet for people. Um, I do want to make one final thing to say. White people, you let people of color or able-bodied people, you let people with disabilities call you an ally. I think it's defined in the eye of the beholder yes. and not in the eyes of the doer. Yeah. I might mess up this quote, but I think it's uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Is that yes. the? Yes. yes, 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 yes. That's that's definitely the message. And I would I would say also to Malia's point, like we're seeing, and and forty five knew this. He knew how hungry people were for power and how hungry they were for hierarchy. And um, we see, you know, what happened in the, in the insurrection, that violence. And you're seeing people's mamas who was church mamas and, you know, people who never knew their parents to be this way, suddenly acting violent and rabid and crazy and just irrational, even at home, even if they weren't at the insurrection, they are acting irrational and violent at home. Mm. And it's, because power really is a disease. And it's like, your hate for other people will consume you. Mm -hmm. And it's the, the healing is so necessary. And you know, when I love that Malia brought up Frederick Douglass because it's like, when he actually fights his slave master and there's this whole tussle and it's like, it was just making him uglier. It's like the, the snake eating the tail situation when it comes to supremacy. And I also think it's why we have an ebb and flow of moments where we have what I call the facade of democracy. Mm -hmm. you, know, um, you know, after slavery, we had something that very much looked like a, a, a multiracial democracy. And then we had the Black Codes and Jim Crow. And we see this type of pushback again and again. And right now, everyone's in this, this mode of look at what our democracy looks like. 
Also, look at the 253 bills across the country aiming to suppress the vote. This yeah. We have the, the highest number of anti-trans bills we've ever had in history right now. And it's like we are bleeding. Um, 43 states. 43 states have introduced a legislation to suppress the vote. Yes. We are bleeding. We are bleeding. Yeah, we hate, are. Killing, hate and hierarchy and white supremacy is literally killing us. Yeah. Another quote, um, history repeats itself. Those that yeah. don't know their history are doomed to repeat it. You yeah. just made reference to reconstruction. We're in a similar uh, you know, uh, emotional uh, situation right now. Uh, let me uh, go back a little bit to the time of the 54th because again, we see parallels today. When uh, men enlisted in the 54th Massachusetts, the government promised them a wage of $13 a month. However, when they got their first paychecks, the soldiers of the 54th only received $10. So despite serving their country in the same capacity as white soldiers, because of their race, the men of the 54th received payment as laborers. Outraged by this injustice, they boycotted payment. Uh, the men of the 54th were supported by allies or co-conspirators such as Mark DeMorty, the African-American supplier or settler to the 54th who extended credit to them to carry them through the duration of the boycott. And it turns out Colonel Shaw also supported his men in a July 2nd, 1863 letter to Governor Andrew about the pay discrepancy, he said, quote, they should be mustered out of the service or receive the full pay which was promised them. So considering these examples of Shaw and DeMorty, how can allies today effectively assist in the fight for racial justice by using their positions of privilege and power, John? using their voice in, uh, in multiple means, both their words and the soldiers in the 54th did. It was all over the news that their pay was half of what, uh, almost half of what um, uh, uh, white soldiers received. And uh, when they finally, it took 18 months for the federal government to um, finally rectify it, but they did receive back pay. Uh, so one, one uh, one message from their example is that one needs patience um, and to be very vocal to a protest against this kind of um, this kind of prejudice mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. continue mm -hmm. to do so. And mm -hmm. I mean, the abolitionists, black and white, and the activists. You never one of the uh, patience is a necessity. You never know when the dial might shift. And when it shifts, it can shift dramatically. But you have to you have to have faith. One has to have faith in one's voice, whatever form uh, an individual feels is most effective in using a voice, whether it's spoken or whether it's words or music or visual art. I mean, it's one of the foundations of being human is that we have a voice that can be disseminated and that voice has immense power. Hmm. On the pay issue, Barbara Lewis, um, reminds us that the um, men of the 54th may have received $10 per month, but she believes they also had to be docked $3 a month to cover their uniforms. Yes, which is why they essentially it was half pay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, um, Malia, I'm gonna go back to you, uh, talk about um, how allies today can effectively assist in the fight for racial justice by using their privilege. Yes, so um, first I'll start in the workplace because I think that's where we see a lot of discrepancy. Management looks a certain way and the further down you go, that's where their diversity sits. Um, so if you want to be um, a decent person or go as far as being a co-conspirator, um, I think what you wanna do is first start asking questions, right? Why is this this way? Why do we care about things like seniority so much, right? Identify the things in your culture that in your business culture that keep people out. So when people say things like cultural fit, don't just not ask, 
does the cultural fit mean that we can't seem to attract people of color because we're not hiring them, right? Should we look at that? And then where you do have your power, use it. So, you know, in my work, when I work with companies, you know, everyone looks towards the management. And that's really important because they can budget, right? Because, but the work really needs to come from the bottom. So, you know, if you are in charge of the coffee, buy coffee from BIPOC coffee places, right? Find that if you're in charge of the book clubs, pick diverse books. It doesn't matter where you are because at the end of the day, there is no silver bullet to change everything. So change the one thing you can change, right? If you're, by, if you're in charge of buying company gifts, buy them from local minority businesses. If you're in charge of hiring, you make sure you have diverse hiring panels right? What can we do? And so that's around work. And then I think personally, and this is where it gets a little hard because there's so much narrative about, about this, but do you live in all white neighborhoods? You know, did you tell yourself it's better to move to the suburbs because it's better education rather than wanting to be in the city and advocate for better education in the public schools here? Um, by the way, hashtag nice white parents, if anyone wants to listen to a great podcast on that. Um, but start questioning, like, am I okay with the fact that my kids are in all white schools, that they speak one language? Um, and, and really, if you can start shifting things, shift things, right? Um, but personally, question your story. Do it lovingly to yourself. Don't beat yourself up. We don't need white guilt. That doesn't help anything. We don't need white fragility. That doesn't help anything. But work through it. Join things like Surge, the white ally group, right, that, that works with folks. Um, and then at work, ask questions and use the power that you have. Mm. Janae, you kind of uh, um, specifically referenced this a little bit earlier, um, that people have to become uncomfortable. But I'm, I'm imagining that there are many people who have privilege and power, who are reluctant to use it on behalf of um, communities of color because they fear loss of the privilege. Oh, absolutely. Power. Like I said earlier, people it costs people power and privilege to create room for equity and inclusion. And people don't wanna admit, this is why you saw the, the, the people who love to say, but I voted for Obama when they went and voted for 45. It's, it was one thing to, to vote for Obama when it wasn't costing you your privilege. Here came a man who was now saying, I'm gonna give you back your power. I'm gonna give you more power. And so then you chose your power, which we see this type of thing happen. People, people are all good with equity movements as long as it doesn't threaten their power. And when someone comes along and says, I'm gonna give you power, then they'll just, it, I just said to a friend today who does this kind of work, there are certain types of allies who will follow the great black tradition of lifting as we climb unless it means you're going to get further than them and then they'll mm. kick you off the ladder. Mm. And then stomp you down. And stomp you down. <laughs> and it's really about um, when Malia said people had to, uh, to not have white fragility and white guilt, it's really, can these allies, can they um, decenter themselves? Can they get out of their ego and out of their feelings and get over themselves enough to care about what equity and basic human decency looks like? And I love that John was pushing patience. I have none. I'm like, I believe what James Baldwin said, the time is now. I believe what allies need yes. is persistence. Like yes. you need persistence. You need to, to understand that even if the change doesn't happen immediately, you must persist. Um, and that's kind of how I look at it. Like be there through the lens of persistence. Yes. Keep a fervor. I, I agree with you completely. I didn't mean to suggest gradualism, but it's just that, you know, the most right, Frederick Douglass, I mean, he, he wanted change now, beginning from the time that he was still a fugitive. And, and so from 1845 to 1860, things are getting worse. Slavery is expanding. It's becoming even more of a slave nation. 
And you need to re you re need to retain your hope and your vigilance and your determination because a lot what happens to a lot of actors they give up they lose hope because the power is so great. Frederick Douglass has another great line about power: "Power concedes nothing without a fight." Or mm. that's right. Um, that's right. Can I, I'm sorry. Can I just jump in here? Yes, it's please. Reminding me a story of when I worked for Harry Belafonte and. For those of you who might know Harry Belafonte, I know some of the younger audience, he's the guy who sang Deo that you hear at the Yankee games, but he was very famous at one point. And he was blacklisted because of his race work, um, you know, because of his work with the communism. He bought Martin Luther King his house. He bought Martin Luther King his life insurance so that his children wouldn't be in poverty. And he suffered a great deal for it, right? We talk about Sidney Poitier, even though Harry was actually more, uh, more famous and more awarded than, than Sidney Poitier is. But when he would get so angry when he would see, um, especially like a lot of like the pimp juice, like rapper, Little John, like that's what was popular when I was working for him. And he would get so frustrated, you know, and he would be like, you know what I had to do when we were da, 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 da. And I saw that. And what I also saw was it was hard for little John to want to become Harry Belafonte and become blacklisted and lose all of his fame. Paul Robeson, exactly, a mentor of Harry. Why Harry collected art? Because Paul Robeson told him he had to have some stuff in the house that he could trade when necessary. But anyway, um, you know, and so I think Janae talked before about how we all need to sort of get over white supremacy and, and white capitalism. And I think you know, as we think about allyship, you know, I just think about how Harry just wanted every famous black actor um, to do what he did. And um, we thank God we don't need that, but it's a question that we all have to have amongst ourselves. Hmm. You talk about, uh, Malia, you said, you know, we all have to get over it. There's a, you know, obviously a collective brainwashing that has taken place for hundreds and hundreds of years. And I'm gonna go to a comment uh, that was in the chat uh, this person says, I was born in 1952, born in New England to a very aware family, but I still grew up in a world where whiteness was normative and at most blacks were passive beneficiaries of white American benevolence or were threats to that normative Americanness. I've spent the rest of my life fighting that ingrained cultural bias. How do we consider supporting that fight in those around us. And then I would add, uh, within us. Janae? Um, I mean, I, I kind of led earlier when you first, the very first question you asked me, I led with kind of this thing that it's in us. You know, we, if you are in America, there's an umbrella of supremacy. We're all various levels of wet, um, no matter who you are. There's, there's someone with less privilege and power than you. We live in a hierarchy. Um, so fighting it within yourself is a daily practice. You know, we this conversation is centered on allyship and we're talking about all these, these different ways in which you can be an ally or when do you know you're an ally? And first, let me echo uh, my good sister Malia and say, you don't get to say you're an ally. The people you're caping for get to say that. Um, but what I will say is the work ain't never done. Um, the work is never done. You're never a perfect player because ain't no perfect people. Um, you're, you're always doing the work. You're always checking yourself. You're always reading the room to see how you can be more helpful. Every, you know, and some days you're going to get it wrong. Mm -hmm. So that's where grace and getting back up again and learning how to what I call fail with grace and fail with a, a, a hunger to do better again comes into play. Um, so it's it's that um, persistence, that persistence to want change, to want change outside of yourself, but first want change in yourself, but also to know that many things can be true at once. And as you're fighting for a better country, for a better culture, for a better world, you also are fighting for a better you. It's all interrelated. It's like that interpersonal thing where everything is correlated. Uh, Malia talked about yoga, which is all, you know, it's all the energy is connected together. So it's it's really every day getting up and making a better choice. Mm. Every day. Okay. 
I'm going to catch up with the chat a little bit. Um, first, <clears throat> someone says Central Park Karen voted for Obama. Uh, I have to defend my name, Karen, but uh, anyway, Central Park Karen voted for Obama. Um, and then another panelist says, I think some people voted for Obama thinking they were getting a kind Negro who would reassure them. And then they discovered that they had elected a black man. <laughs> uh, John, I wanna give you an opportunity to, to uh, respond to that question. How do we address the unconscious biases that are within all of us? I think um, what Janae said and uh, Malia both, one is to recognize that the history of this nation has been a white man's nation and that depends upon bias. And so you recognize what almost all of us, at least um, until over the, you know, if we're over 20 years old, I mean, even today to recognize the profound degree of racism and white bias and the what we're up against. And it's one of the reasons why um, the, the, um, sh the Shah's monument, the Civil War, led to an opportunity in theory to expand democracy with the Reconstruction Amendments that was a direct result of the recognition that the only reason that the Civil War was won by the Union was because of the crucial support of African-Americans, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that this allyship worked. Mm -hmm. And in 65, the most racist white had uh, recognized that. Um, and so to, to understand the long, profound history of racism that it led to and leads to this uh, white man's democracy, uh, to, to recognize that and to recognize what you're up against um, is very important. It's very important because then you recognize the, the biases that you might've grown up with that, that relying on the past is, is not the answer. It's using the past to dramatically change the present and the future. Um, Being inspired from the past, mm -hmm. transform the future. I would imagine that the founding fathers probably did not anticipate that at one point America would be a majority, minority, I don't like to use that word. Uh, certainly when um, those folks arrived from Europe, uh, we were already a multicultural nation because there were Native Americans here who owned the land. Uh, there were enslaved Africans yeah. here. So we were already a multicultural yeah. nation. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but at the framing of the, yeah. the uh, documents uh, yeah. that uh, founded our nation, uh, it, it was intended at that time that only, to your point, John, uh, that white males would govern this new land. And so that framework, though we... Um, worship it and refer to it, um, it, it seems flawed in some way in that it does not have enough breathing room. It hasn't, it hasn't absorbed and incorporated the changes that we've seen in our country over, over, these, over these years. No, I completely agree. I mean, the only silver lining was in the declaration. Mm -hmm. um, and the line in the declaration of equality of um, all men are created equal and men uh, at that time and men uh, for a lot of people humans and even Jefferson didn't necessarily mean it in my view didn't mean it but the the power that that had especially to African Americans um, was profound um, and it led to uh, early on, a uh, fairly dramatic change. Afri in Massachusetts, African American men enjoyed the full suffrage um, from post revolutionary period through the 19th century. Um, not in every state, uh, it was governed by the states, but um, that was the one small silver lining was in the, the power of uh, the Declaration. And, and as uh, everyone knows there's long been a debate on to what degree should the Constitution be based on these ideals in the Declaration. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, catching up with the chat again, Dr. King uh, <clears throat> from Felicia. Dr. King says, 
uh, once said that of many white Americans, if they're uneasy with injustice, but unwilling yet to pay a significant price to eradicate it. This seems to be a theme. Malia, you're smiling there. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it is a theme, right? And the theme is, is that hard work we don't like to do, right? We like to be comfortable um, and, and, and we don't like to be uncomfortable. And I know that every time I, you know, watch a Beyonce video and look for my gym membership, right? Um, we understand how we can live in these two worlds. Um, you know, but I, I, wanna, I, I wanna go, you know, I'll back even a little further, right? What gave these men the right? And it was the European Enlightenment experiment, yes. right? It was this idea that they had this divine right of, you know, the, the divine right of kings, then they reject monarchy, and then they become those guys, right? Um, and so, you know, again, when we look at that whole idea, it's about power. It's about the power of one person, right? Um, and that's not the healthiest societies to have, you know? So I, I think that we're, we're coming to the end of the European Enlightenment experiment, which is great. We can figure something else out. And I hope it is more fair, right? I, I, I hope it questions um, some of these things we thought were enlightened. Um, they may have been enlightened for kings and queens, but they weren't <laughs> enlightened for workers. Um, and, and really get honest about how we get back to societies that are accountable to one another that are accountable to the earth, that steward the earth, that steward, you know, our elders, um, and, and that has, that, 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 that's able to sustain life, um, which is not what we've been able to do with the European Enlightenment experiment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Catching up with the chat, Christopher says that he hopes the Center for Anti-Racist Research um, will become an interstate of sorts for data and policy change. That's at my alma mater, Boston University. We're very proud of the work that got Dr. Kendi is doing there. Um, <clears throat> this goes to all the panelists. Uh, we in Boston have a harder time giving up power than other places. Uh, they think that New York is different. Is Boston more entrenched than other places? Hmm, thinking, thinking. Let's ask the Boston Globe writer <laughs> what she thinks. So, you know, there's racism everywhere. Um, when I moved here, all my friends were like, for why? Like, Pero, like Boston? Like, it was a, a universal scoff um, about coming here and being Black. And, and everyone, all of my friends know about the very black things I write about. So they're just like, you already had your life threatened in Kansas City. Now you want to go there. And um, so it's hard for me to say this place is any more racist than another place. However, does the racism I, manifest itself differently? That, that's however, what I would say is um, Boston is complicit in its very false narrative. Boston is also happy to, to embrace its narrative of being this very white city when it is indeed not a white city. This is a 25% black city. This is a 25% immigrant city. There, there is a large uh, Latinx community here. This is, this is a majority people of color community um, only it don't look like that and if you live here it don't feel like that because the power system replicates what we have known white supremacy to be for always and this is why you get a collective gasp and a praise them and hands up when we see uh, Kim Janey when we see Ayanna Presley when we see Bud when we see uh, Rollins because it represents a shift and hopefully not just a new day, not just a passing moment of change, but a real shift. I look at the work that Beckma is doing and I'm like, yes, baby, like things are changing. New Boston is- Today, for, for people that don't know uh, what Beckma stands for and what they're doing, just give us a oh. quick thumbnail. Um, the- Black Economic Council of Massachusetts. Oh, you got him. <laughs> Black Economic uh -huh. 
what Massachusetts is fighting for um, economic empowerment and equity, I really think MLK would be very proud. People like to, white people like to make Martin Luther King their little care bear of freedom. And that is not who he was. He was a radical. And I do feel like Vecma is doing uh, the work that King was shut down from doing. They're doing the work that Fred Hampton was shut down from doing. Um, and I see that change coming. We're not there yet, but I have such hope. I have such hope. We are, we are like kicking down the door and I have so much hope. But yeah, this place manifests its supremacy in a very cold, um, segregated, hierarchical, parochial way. And um, it, it, it's very, it's, it's a place of liberal elitism and academia that's very happy to, to play, to put on the costume of abolitionists and, and to play in the legacy of the abolition history that is here while very much enjoying their fat salaries and privileged lives and their power structures without actually doing much to help the poverty and disparity that is here. So I'm like, yes, Rollins, serve them. Yes, Ayanna Presley, serve them. Kim Janey, I am so here and present. <laughs> like it's, we, it's, you know, the new day is coming. So I think people who, who are allies better get comfortable with being uncomfortable real quick and become allies because we got some radical work to do. Okay. All right. Barbara Lewis says in the chat, for the most part, white century after century have benefited from black labor and creativity and black lives are under regular and persistent white threat. And, and just a little historical clarification to follow up on um, Boston as a city. John, I'm going to ask you to reflect on this. Um, while Boston itself may not have been as active a participant in the slave trade, and that um, is, is attributed to the Southern states, uh, indeed, there, Boston was involved in benefiting from the slave trade. Hugely and important. a lot of people don't understand that history, if you could clarify that for us. So a lot of um, virtually, well not virtually, uh, yeah, a, arguably a large majority of Boston elites, families in the colonial period in the early republic benefited immensely from the Atlantic slave trade. Um, so a lot of the a lot of the endowment of Harvard is it got its start from the slave trade. Same with other old institutions, and in many respects, um, those families, the offspring of those families, are still living today, and their wealth comes from, still emanates from some of that slavery and slave trade, mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, there is, it, you know, some families are trying to um, figure out what to do, but Boston's wealth, I mean, it's a number of scholars have highlighted that the, that the entire country benefited immensely from slavery. Um, slavery was everywhere in North America. There were slaves in, the, in Boston, um, both Native Americans and Africans as uh, slaves. Uh, Massachusetts was one of the early states to abolish slavery um, because pr frankly, it was not as profitable as the soil for cotton and uh, coffee and uh, other slave grown crops uh, in the South. The climate was not as conducive to huge profits but the, the wealth of early Bostonians and Bay Staters came um, largely from slavery. Because the merchants were financing- Merchants uh, the were financing slave ships. Merchants Italy. were themselves own property in the mm -hmm. West Indies or in slave territories in Central America, um, especially the British West Indies. The big trade was with the British West Indies, which was mm -hmm. a slave region. And mm -hmm. so they, it was one of the main sources of trade. They made a huge amount of money. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I have read somewhere, and maybe it's an urban myth, that even um, a, a store like Brown Brothers 
uh, supposedly got its beginning in the slave trade because they were the original um, uh, 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 provider of the garments that the enslaved people wore. And that that's how Brown Brothers began its rise to uh, what we now know is a very Tony uh, retail location for purchasing apparel. Yes, I, I've heard that too, but that's true with a lot of, a, a large number of the old, any old financial firm, chances are that their, their money, their, the foundation of their wealth was based on slavery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and the, right, and people's wealth, uh, you know, as when I was working at the bank and we were talking about how far back do we want to go, and I was like, how old is this bank, right? Because if yes, we're yes, old, yes, we yes. may actually have taken <laughs> some paper that said 50 people yes. worth $6,000, here's my deposit, right? Um, yes. It's, you know, it was the economic driver of the, you know, of, of the country, of the colonies, right? I mean, for us to think that slavery just helped the South is, you know, it is not to understand national economics, right? Yeah, um, we were all bought in and we were all bought in globally as well, right? This was a triangle trade route. I mean, we can call our brothers in India, right? There's other folks that we can call who have similar stories to us right. um, like this. You know, the, the other thing about Boston that I just want to point out because I think it's really, really important. And it was this little story that I heard in the, um, Black Heritage Trail, which really should be called the Freedom Trail, because that was actually when we were free, a free country, um, when we abolished slavery. But they were saying that there was this, and please, you know, John, correct me, or, you know, the other history buffs um, and experts out there, correct me, but that that, that after the, um, the fugitive slave law came out, that mm -hmm. abolitionists were like, we're rejecting that, we're not listening to that, no slaves will be brought back. And then they said, actually, Boston passed an ordinance that said, okay, if you're here now, you're free, but you can't, but anyone who comes in after is going to be part of the fugitive slave law. And I remember when I heard that story, I thought, wow, imagine that making it to Massachusetts and then not being able to bring your cousin because they're not safe. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something about that history that speaks to how BIPOC and especially Black people feel in Boston. Yes. You know, um, when, when I will go to work in other cities that are as racist, as segregated, um, that you, you still have a, a different type of Black power structure. And mm -hmm. here, the Black power structure very much wants to align itself with the white power structure, you know? And I don't know if it's because we had to get that habit, you know, because it was like we couldn't even bring our cousins up to like get them free, you know. I, I don't know what it is, but um, what I know is that the work feels different in Chicago. It does feel different in New York. It, it does feel different in these places. And I, I'll uh -oh. end by saying when Baratunde came here, he wrote an article saying Baratunde Thurston came here. He wrote an article saying, Boston, where do you hide your Black people? And it was a hilarious article, but I think it's also important for us as Black people to ask, why are we hiding? And, and why don't we see ourselves on Newberry Street? And why don't you, like, yeah, they'll follow us, whatever, they'll get over it eventually. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, <laughs> you know, we want some of that tawny, right? Shopping going on, like, and, and I think we in Boston sometimes um, will take on the oppression in a way that is, as old as this country. Okay, I'm going to go back to uh, back to history and the Shaw, and uh, combine a question in the chat with one that I have for you uh, regarding the monument. Um, why the black soldiers so much in the background, and the horse gets more play? Ruth Ellen Fitch has asked that question. Uh, looking at the Shaw 54th Massachusetts Memorial, it is of course impossible to ignore the stark contrast between the commander, Robert Gould Shaw, and the men of the regiment. Shaw is at the forefront of the memorial, elevated on his horse. The armed men, anonymous African-American soldiers, march on foot. John, uh, talk to us about the historic context of the monument's creation in 1897. And how is this artistic rendition of the 54th a reflection of the reality that black soldiers faced in 1863? 
short answer, it's a good reflection of what they faced. The uh, origins of the monument was led by survivors of the 54th uh, Regiment themselves. And initially, veterans sought um, a monument in Beaufort, South Carolina. They wanted a monument near, uh, near uh, where, where the uh, famous charge was. And they planned a memorial on Morris Island. Um, South Carolina whites prevented that from happening. Um, and the original funds then were used to create um, the uh, Shaw Memorial. And originally, um, I should say that this Shaw Memorial was the first time that blacks and whites were portrayed in a, uh, in a, a real, so-called realistic um, uh, relief or statue um, in uh, the country. The, uh, the tradition had been behind it. And in fact, the original plan was that there was, it was originally going to be an equestrian statue just of Robert Gould Shaw. And the family uh, nixed that. They said it was pretentious and it excluded African-Americans. It excluded mm -hmm. the regiment. Uh, and so that led to uh, Shaw on his horse, who is uh, the commander with uh, 23 black soldiers. And uh, for its time, the realism in the soldiers was great. It, it reflected a, an advance. I mean, the, almost all the statues of African-Americans have been depicted as kneeling slaves. Mm -hmm. And depicted as kneeling slaves as though whites were emancipating them. Mm -hmm. You know, think mm -hmm. of the Lincoln Monument. There's a mm -hmm. replica in Boston. There's one in Lincoln Park. Uh, there has been debate with the Black Lives Matter should, you know, what should happen to it because it's, it's somewhat demeaning. It, it, it denies a degree of agency to um, Black folk. This, um, you see mar soldiers marching with steadfast purpose. Yes, mm -hmm. it's the fact that the horse and Shaw is front and center. It reflects this, the, the racism and the hierarchy that still exists and certainly existed then. But in Stephen, terms of Stephen the, Pepper says we should check out, check out two books by Jared Hardesty for documentation of slavery in New England in the 17th and 18th centuries, yeah. especially in Boston. Yeah. Uh, but John, I just wanna follow up on uh, something that you just said. So even though we are now looking at this monument in terms of how we see, see things in 2021, um, at the time having black soldiers stand erect and march with their colonel, even though he was yes. you know, more prominent on the horse, that was revolutionary and progressive for its time, for, correct? For, yes, as I said, that's, that was, that was a, 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 a dramatic aesthetic and cultural shift. It's the first time that African-American soldiers are depicted with themselves in dignified terms and it's the first time a company is depicted especially a regiment that's an african-american regiment these soldiers are with their commander who's white but it is it was uh, it was it was truly revolutionary in terms of sculpture and what was ha what was happening in the united states at the time mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. you know we can say yeah there are it still shows a degree of bias but the, in terms of sculpture, um, in terms of a monument, uh, that was, uh, it was a dramatic departure from what had been. That was John, progress. Those, yeah, it was yes, progress. It was progress. It does, yeah, and, and John, progress. for those that don't know yet the history of the 54th, talk about the individual faces of the black soldiers. So the, um, that, yeah, yeah, the individual faces, um, uh, St. Gaudens, God, he, um, he, he hired African-Americans and so he depicted these faces based on individuals that he, tr tr he selected uh, models based on the actual figures themselves. So he really, he went out of his way to be as realistic as possible mm -hmm. in his depiction um, of uh, these soldiers. There mm -hmm. are some uh, exaggerations. So there's been a debate on the, um, the figure at the top, is it um, is it a uh, is it an angel um, or is it an angel of um, 
of uh, is it an angel of death? It is. Is it an angel of victory or of courage? There's actually been a debate on that. You can see mm -hmm. her. You can see this with with the flowing robes, um, and uh, but the soldiers themselves, uh, Gaudens went to great. Um, great length and effort to be as realistic as as he possibly could. Mm -hmm. And St. Gaudens' um, uh, evolution around the subject of race, I understand, changed from when he began uh, the monument to when it was actually complete. At the time, he wasn't going to use, uh, when he first began, he wasn't planning on using individual black faces. Right, right. And initially, he was he, he wanted to just create a monument of Shaw on the horse, and that's it. Mm -hmm. that's it mm -hmm. so this white man on the horse would be the the sole visual representation of this truly heroic um black regiment and so fortunately the family and uh you know nixed that idea and that led to uh the african americans the reds of the blacks being included mm -hmm. uh, and 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 um, St. Gaudens wasn't necessarily being conservative. That was the tradition. I mean, yeah. the, the tradition of, of memorializing the regiment was to focus just on the commander and put him on horseback. And that was, that was the tradition. Hmm. Janae, you see a and lot of those in Boston. <laughs> yes, you do. Yes, you do. One was recently removed from yeah. uh, Park <laughs> yeah. Square. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, Janae and Malia, you know, as our national dialogue around public monuments and their meaning in intensifies, how does the Shaw 54th fit into that conversation? Malia? You mean, how does it fit in the, as, as an art piece? Yes. Well, how does it fit? You know, there's, there, there, uh, all around the country, uh, monuments, um, to the old South, uh, to the Confederacy, uh, are being removed, put away, stored, torn down. Um, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, we right. We, but so, in, should we do that? Is that what you're asking? Well, I, I don't know. In Boston, we um, we revere. We definitely have to get rid of the Lincoln one. I mean, I think they yeah. may have already gotten rid yeah, of that. Yeah, that one's gone. And that so one, that, that right, gone. Yeah, so that, so that was good. And that's, and if we're that's voting for ones to get right. rid of. And the Lincoln um, one in Boston was a replica of what was in. Right, right. No, yeah. I remember the first time I saw that, you know, I'm from Hawaii. So we have a like a completely different understanding because we're taught about, you know, colonization. That That's how we're taught American history is through the lens of the zebra, not the lion. Um, <laughs> and when I moved and when I saw that, I was just like, where am I living? <laughs> like, oh my mm -hmm. God, I, it gets cold and they do this. Like it was, um, it was, you know, a, a real shock, but you know, I, so I think all art in context to tell a story is important. However, I think, and this gets back to, you know, the conversation we were having um, before, I think hero worship is dangerous no matter who is being worshiped, right? So I often joke around and say like, I think we should name streets after like, foods, you know, like I would love to live on like avocado and, you know, on the corner of avocado and lily, right? Like we can actually find ways to live without worshiping people, right? Without putting people on pedestals. And so all monuments make me, all monuments that do that make me nervous. And, and that's why I'm also so excited about the King Memorial and that it's this embrace of this love and it's actually something that we can all move with rather than continue the hero worship of King, which ends up whitewashing him. Mm -hmm. mm. uh, Jan Janae, this monument, <clears throat> the Shaw 54th is, is regarded uh, as one of 10 uh, great monuments that changed America. It's known nationally, but, but how does the Shaw 54th Memorial fit into the conversation that we're having today about um, public monuments? So public art is incredibly important to me. It's something I write about frequently. Um, I think the work that Sarah Lewis does over at Harvard around vision and justice is incredibly important in the role that art plays in social justice movements and in vision and how we literally use sight to, to see who has a value and who has grounding in this country is essential. Um, I don't think that this memorial needs to, I don't personally think this memorial needs to come down. Um, the Lincoln one did, many did. Um, I think 
it's very important that we recognize many things can be true at the same time. We can look at that memorial and see all of what that is problematic with it. And there is much problematic with it. Like that placement, that means something. It was intentional. It was done on purpose. And mm -hmm. it meant something then and it still means something now. Um, however, it was also radical at the time, just like it was radical for um, Charles Schultz to, to create Franklin in the Peanuts. And he did that because a reader actually, a reader was like, look, we're at a time of civil rights and you know, it would mean a lot to have this black character. He makes this black character. And at that time it was radical, but every year around Thanksgiving, you see woke Twitter, like, look how segregated and racist Franklin is. Mm -hmm. And it's like, at the time, in that era, in that context, Franklin was actually incredibly radical. And for him to make Franklin and put Franklin at that table, period, was radical. So it's, I use the Franklin example because that's how I look at this memorial. At that time, that is what was considered radical. Um, it does still have problematic issues with it. I don't know that it needs to come down. I think there's a time for cancellation and there's a time for conversation. And that, that is a memorial that could be used for conversation, much like had we allowed Steve Locke to create what he was trying to create you know, at Faneuil Hall, that would have been an amazing way to talk about Boston's history in the slave trade. Um, Janae, I'm gonna ask you just to clarify for those that don't know about Steve, artist Steve Locke and how he was going to fit into the controversy around the renaming of Faneuil Hall. Give us Art a- Steve Locke had this um, very brilliant and bold idea to create a plaque um, that would heat up to body temperature um, to remind people of the bodies that were bought and sold at Faneuil Hall, rather than renaming it to force people, because we all know um, whether people, agree, I know there's lots of people who disagree with me, but we could have renamed Faneuil Hall and the people, the, the millions of people who come in and out of Boston would have still called it Faneuil Hall. Just like we rename things all the time and people call it the old thing. But a structure, a big structure that you cannot ignore that forces you to grapple with what's happening here, that's education, that's conversation, that's how we can mark time, space, history and create a dialogue. It's how we form the groundwork that Sarah Lewis talks about. Um, you know, I think about what Kahinde Wiley did first in Times Square and then in Richmond, in Richmond where Confederate memorials are everywhere. He erected rumors of war where there is a black man with locks and Jordans on top of a horse, regal, gorgeous, celebrated. And I understand what Malia was saying about hero worship, but the dope thing about what Kahinde did is that could be any black man. It's not, it's not some famous person. It's and like that, that, and that's what makes it powerful is that it is every black man. Every black man, like everyone knows a man that looks like that man with them J's on and them locks on that horse. And he <laughs> is a, he's just so beautiful. Like I've gone there, I've seen it. And that type of work is so like public art is, part of the conversation when we talk about racism, when we talk about justice, when we talk about who matters. So it is important that we have these conversations and, and this the, the uh, 54th Memorial is part of that conversation. It's essential that we be able to talk about these things for, for, for the role they play that hurt our image, but also for the role they played that lifted, that created dignity. I mean, this is why John, John talks about Frederick Douglass and does the, the work does a lot of work around Frederick. I mean, Frederick Douglass understood the power of image. He understood this to be a tool of the revolution. You know, the revolution is four eight-legged spiders. Image is part of that. Art is part of that. It's why it's so it's it's fitting. Uh, and I'm John. I'm going to call on you first. Uh, it's it's fitting that our last question brings our focus back to the title for tonight's conversation: Allyship and the Massachusetts 54th advancing our journey to an anti-racist America. So as people continue to work for racial and social equity in, in the nation and beyond, how might the history of the Massachusetts 54th Regiment and the memorial uh, contribute to this work? John? Well, in one sense, I mean, not only is it the first well-known American civic monument to include dignified representation of blacks, but with the Shaw monument, it's, it's a symbol that you need a multiracial group to defeat a uh, white 
racist, anti-democratic enemy, which is essentially <laughs> what <laughs> happens, uh, that collaborating interracially, interethnically, in terms of intergender, that's the only way that we can achieve any kind of democratic progress in mm -hmm. uh, the country. Uh, mm -hmm. and that's what, in the largest sense, this monument conveys or represents. Um, hmm. And as I said at the beginning, it's why um, African-Americans were, were used from the beginning of the war in the Navy they, and by mid-war virtually, no matter how racist the whites had been early on, they realized that African-Americans were crucial to preserving or winning the war and preserving some idea of democracy. Um, um, thanks, Janae, for putting in the chat a link to your article uh, about Steve Locke's uh, art piece. And uh, Merrill in the chat says, the monument is a rebuke to the assumption that American heroes, founders, true Americans were and are all white. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. um, Malia, um, tell me how you think the the regiment and the memorial will contribute to the overall conversation about allyship. So I feel I feel like the regiment and the the story is some receipts, right? Like you know, like the, like you need to show your receipts, right? That's some of the receipts of us trying, right? And, and I think that's how we should see it. You know, we should see it that a, a long time ago we tried, and you know, as John said, there was. You know, it was in the news that black soldiers weren't getting, you know, weren't getting fair wages. It probably sounds something similar to Amazon conversations now, right? Like we're, we're, we're getting better, but we're also repeating the same things. And so, you know, for me, the, the regimen represents proof that this is not new and proof that failing to actually do it right is also not new. And so whenever I walk by the memorial, I feel proud. Right, I, I, I look at those faces and, and, I, and I feel proud. Um, but I also feel that there's so much more to go that you know it's like you wanna feel proud, but then you also don't wanna feel like there's nothing more to do. You know, So mm -hmm. I think the story is a story of our history. It's a story of receipts of attempts and receipts of success and receipts of failure. Mm -hmm. Our renowned um, artist Napoleon Jones Henderson puts in the chat, he says, recasting ourselves in the image posture, pose, or any other representation of a European subject is, in his opinion, changes or elevates the dialogue of image shift. Um, so, Janae, um, talk to us about how you think the memorial uh, can further the conversation around allyship. I mean, what John and, and my good sis Malia just said is on point. And I, I would echo that with simply saying that memorial represents that, um, you know, despite whiteness being elevated, it still represents the fact that collective liberation requires collective persistence, collective resistance and collective revolution. So mm -hmm. if we gonna get free, it's gonna require collective fight. And I think that pays homage to what that means. Mm -hmm. And it's something that we can, can use to mark a moment when we saw something like that happen and to mark the continued, unfortunate continued uh, fight forward. And it's, it's absolutely necessary. And I, I, what Napoleon said was so important because I mean, that's what Kahinde did in, um, with rumors of war. And I think this type of imaging um, this type of dignity, this type of, they didn't see us as soldiers. They didn't even see us as human. And yet, and yet <laughs> there we were. Mm -hmm. um, it's incredibly powerful. And um, it's, it's a freedom weapon when mm -hmm. wielded when will did appropriately. John, uh, as our historian here, tell us something that we don't know about this monument that you might, uh, that you think might add to our conversation this evening? So um, one is that I, it hasn't been mentioned is that this monument also 
at the time symbolized citizenship for all of those black soldiers. So citizenship, the question of who is a citizen doesn't enter um, the constitution until the 14th amendment in which birthright citizen has become standard. President Trump wanted to repeal that. Hmm. But the, the one, the two, only two symbols of citizenship prior to the 14th amendment was that if you served in the United States military, you were a citizen, you were an equal citizen. And the other symbol is if you received a US passport. And African-Americans from the beginning, they served in the revolution, they served in the war of 1812, and they publicized the fact that we are citizens. So I think I say that because when we see this monument, when we see, despite the problems, we see these dignified, African Americans marching alongside of Shaw on horseback, they're marching and it's a symbol of their pride in their, in their insisting upon their equal citizenship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important to recognize. That's a good note on which to close out. I wish we had more time, but um, sadly we must wrap things up. Um, we cannot thank our panelists enough, Janae Osterhelt, Malia Lazu and John Stauffer for engaging us in this amazing conversation this evening. Thank you very much. And we wanna thank uh, all of you in our audience for participating in tonight's community conversation. The, the comments and the questions that you shared will help the partnership to renew the Shaw 54th Shape Future programs. And you know we've uh, only just begun to scratch the surface on framing the dialogue on race. So stay tuned for more details as plans for the rededication of the Shaw 54th Memorial are underway with new opportunities to engage with us. And for making this series of conversations possible, help me thank the partnership to renew the Shaw 54th Regiment Memorial, the National Park Service, City of Boston, Friends of the Public Garden and Museum of African American History. And I have to give a special thanks to our media sponsors, the Bay State Banter, Bay State Banner and WCVB Channel 5. You can please visit the Shaw 54th Memorial Restoration.org for more information about the partnership, including past and future programs updates on the status of the restoration project now nearly complete and upcoming events to celebrate the memorial's return to its honored place across from the state house on Beacon Hill. The web address is listed in the chat and posted on the Friends of the Public Garden Facebook page. You'll also find a wonderful array of archival television, radio and print media coverage, as well as historical information related to the memorial. And before we close, let me share some good news. Everyone, everyone in the Shaw 54th Zoom room has been entered in a drawing for a swag bag with goodies from all of the partners to renew the Shaw 54th. I am happy to inform you that the 54th person to register for each of the Shaw 54th events receives these gift bags. And I'm pleased to announce that tonight's recipient is Evelyn Battinelli. Congratulations to Evelyn Battinelli. And the friends will be in touch soon to notify you about how to receive your gift. Everyone, please have a great evening. Be well and stay safe.